The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, welcoming you back to one more session of orchestration analysis on Uranus, the Magician, by Gustav Holst. When we left off in the second lecture, we were about halfway through the march, and there were some very cool things happening on the page before, and I really hated to stop right at that point, because... The momentum was really carrying me along as I was analyzing the score for you. But let's just keep going now. The accompaniment, the little ones and fives, cools down to a very, very stripped down octave in contrabassoon and third bassoon. So it's just two instruments here playing octaves. And they are accompanied by two harps. As I've said before, the harp's contribution to this march section is really not all that realistic. But here, I would say, if the harpists are playing mezzo forte, or even forte, then they will come in as more or less an equal partner to what's going on here, so long as these trumpets don't get too loud. I would say once the trumpets play this mezzo forte accent, and this crescendo gets going in the tambourine, the audibility of the harps will really become kind of second class, <laughs> especially in the face of this downward fluttering. But if we just look at the way this continues on, same instruments past that point, by changing to a soft pizzicato in the lower strings, I think that this is much more secure. In fact, I probably would have scored this from the beginning here. And I know what he wants to do, don't get me wrong. I'm not being just a very practical purist. I know that he wants to have a softer plucking accompaniment to short notes on low bassoon and contra bassoon. And then he wants things to firm up a little bit here. And then he wants things to be really firm as the accompaniment goes to arco. I appreciate that. But I still feel that this is pretty weak. I mean, he could have done pianissimo pizzicato and then piano pizzicato and gotten pretty much the same kind of effect, at least in a concert situation where the harpists are sitting towards the back on the left and it's kind of hard to hear them. Of course, in a recording studio or in a recorded performance, you can put the mics right next to the harps and get rid of that problem, but that's still kind of cheating in a way. Right. Notice one more thing about this accompaniment, and that is when the lower strings go to an arco, the third bassoon and contra bassoon just pretty much drop out, as they're not really needed by that point. Notice that Hulse is keeping everything really soft on this page. The only thing that really jumps out are little textural features like this, and also the ends of phrases, right? Right? And then something similar here. Otherwise, this whole page is really soft. And in fact, even on the next screen, you will see that half the page is also soft, and there isn't really a build until halfway through, going towards the end of the screen. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's jump back over to here and look at these trumpets. And we're going so fast with this 6-4, it really feels like a 6-8. And it could have easily been scored like that, but I do like the psychological firmness of the 6-4 time. This is also cool, the way the tambourine gets the emphasis in the middle of the bar. So, t -t 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 right? So it's basically just pushing a little bit right there along with the trumpets. And then here we've got a nice tambourine roll leading to bubble bubble in the timpani going back to the beginning of the piece, right? That same little riff. Very neat, solely passage. And notice how 
solely does not need to be loud, right? We've got a piano accompaniment, and the effect here is just very businesslike uh, of this marching along with the trumpets. It's a really nice touch. It shows experience with brass band scoring. This really reminds me of some of the other brass band scoring that I've heard from British brass bands. Then these are really similar to what we've seen before. That doodle 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 doodle. It's really based on the bum 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 bum. But once again, using that framework as a ladder from which to descend through the entire range of the wind section going down to the bass clarinet. The bassoons are otherwise occupied, but first and second bassoon could have pitched in here if they were needed, but that's not really the timbre that Holst wants. And then the winds take over here, sort of developing this. And here we get really, really, once again, Christmassy, right? Similar to Jupiter with the piccolo chiming in here from above. And it's as if, because of the way this is harmonized, it's as if little jingles were playing at the same time, like a glockenspiel or something like that, or perhaps even a triangle in the background. It's just that really, really high frequency stuff that goes on. So that might be a little trick for your book, and that is to just add a little piccolo here and there, especially if you've got two of them, add a little piccolo here and there to add some icing on top, but at a soft dynamic, right? This works in a very charming way because it is a soft dynamic. And what's cool is that these very, very high pitches here are totally possible at a soft dynamic on piccolo, whereas just approaching some of these same exact pitches on flute would cause a lot of strain for the player, right? Or be impossible, right? Like this high G here. This is kind of a cool idea right in here. This nice sustain behind the horns. Lovely idea, which themselves push and just a teeny bit of tenor and bass trombones in here, harmonizing with this octave triple octave in six horns. This is kind of fun too, the tuba coming in and adding a little bit of weight to the arco strings. And this repeat of the timpani riff really seems like it's kind of accelerating or going nuts, but really it's just fours against threes here in the six four time, ending with a little punch at the end with the bass tuba as well. And now you can see the whole purpose of the bass tuba in there, and that is so that the listener's ear doesn't lose track of where the ones and fives are leading up to this note here. Now this is kind of cool. The trumpets sort of ape what was going on in the horns. Bum 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 bum. A little bit of harmonization from the horns this time, rather than the lower brass as was on the previous page. And this is neat. That bum, 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 bum. It returns as a very blithe little comment, right? Instead of being this massive motive, it just becomes this little commentary that leads things back to where they were here, right? Bum, 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 bum. Weird chord, and then back to where we were because bum, 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 bum. Right? It helps to center us a bit. Now here, Holst is not really turning things up in terms of volume, in terms of dynamics, but he's just turning it up in terms of mass, right? Once again, favorite trick of Holst is to not waste a crescendo, but to just pile instruments on. And we've seen this before, especially in this movement. So this little dancing back and forth again, ending on a bit of a higher chord, because of that higher C sharp. The oboe family and the horns working together beautifully. Oboes and horns really make nice combinations together, and it's really great the way that they can work together, right? So if we just were to take it apart, we could see that we've got ah two horns here, 
and they are basically doubling what's going on in first oboe. I myself would probably bulk this up a little bit, but I can understand why he went with just the first oboe, is because he doesn't want those conflicts. And I have to say, piano on a low B is really going to come out mezzo forte. So if it's going to be mezzo forte anyways, it is going to match the idea of piano here in the horns. Right? So this could possibly balance, but it's still going to be a little tweaky if the conductor really wants to get it right. Then we've got this D sharp, which is sounding G sharp, concert G sharp. And here we've got E flats in the third and fourth horns, which are enharmonically the same thing. Since English horn and French horn both have the same up a fifth transposition, right? So this is going to sound down a fifth to A flat, G sharp. It's the same exact note. And then here at the bottom, we've got these low Bs riding along, and low B is the same thing as an E down a fifth, which is the same E as this down an octave, right? So this is a complete and total doubling, and you can see those same notes are here in the upper strings. Interestingly, the horns provide their own commentary, right? Only the third and fourth really sit on any kind of harmony, and so do the strings and the bass oboe. But the standard oboes and English horn hold a chord along with the violins here, which is kind of nice. The clarinets come in to thicken up those horns. And now we finally get a crescendo with all of these other elements joining in. So that is why it sounds so massive, really. We added some mass here while keeping things soft. And now we are crescendoing while adding even more mass. So you end up with one of the most titanic crescendos right here, which is going to pay off in the next screen. A few things to note about this, although it really isn't all that complicated, it does look a bit fearsome. So let's break it down a little bit. Starting with the low notes, we have the contrabassoon coming back in, joining in with the double basses. And that relationship continues all the way to the end of the page. Interestingly, the cellos don't really get any doubling much to speak of until right here when the bass trombone comes in. And let me tell you, that is all that's really needed in this context. Of course, the bassoons do help out as well. Don't get me wrong. The third bassoon is basically doubling the contrabassoon and the first bassoon is doubling the cellos. So that is a bit of an exception there. Now let's look at the thematic instruments. We have a very interesting chorale here in the strings, harmonized melody. And when we get to here, there is a voice crossing of the violas jumping over the top of the second violins and then the second violins jumping over the top of the firsts, while the firsts interlock with the violas. It's all quite fun, and I think that this is not really anything orchestrational. It is something that could have easily just been kept with everything in its place, because there isn't a huge difference here in terms of the timbre, especially with all the doubling that's going on up here. It, the niceties are going to be lost on the audience. But it's fun for the players. And it's a great way of setting up the seconds right where they're going to be in the big push right in here. Now, if we compare that to what's going on with the oboes, which are basically doubling, more or less, then adding on the flutes, which are doubling that top line here, then you see that they're pretty much staying in their place. Voice crossing is not really the same thing for the winds as it is for the strings. Notice that the clarinets are playing some of the pitches that are covered by the violins and violas down here. If you remember that we are in B flat, then this all sort of comes off as really a G-sharp octave with an E stuck in the middle. And you might think E? Yes, G-flat, 
is enharmonically the same note as E. That's one little trick to try to remember when you are reading B flat, is that a G flat can end up being an E. All right, so basically we've got some of these pitches covered in here while providing a low G sharp, all right? So there's, there's the G sharp that's being doubled right up here by this B flat. And then this lower B flat is providing a G sharp enharmonically below the violas. All right, we could get into breaking down the harmony, but we're leading to some place, so let's get there. So this G sharp octave and a sixth, let's call it, is repeated an octave higher as the melody starts to climb in the strings and upper winds. And I just love this low written B here. This would be B in the middle of the bass staff, right? Because this is transposing down an octave. And that comes in right as the timpani starts to roll on exactly the same pitch here, pianissimo. Meanwhile, we get a little bit of punch now and again from the trombones and the bass tuba, underlining each two-bar phrase. Let's put it that way. With just a little bit of added emphasis in the middle of the bar by the trumpets. Continuing on, sort of building up a little bit, just in terms of mass, as the crescendo rolls along. And that's also doubled by the cymbal. And a rolled suspended cymbal. Very, very cool here. And that's all leading upwards to this bum, 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 and so on, and higher than I can hum along to. This is really neat right in here. Some of these small details, when you hear a mass harmony like this, can get left out, but they really help to tie things together. And that is right here, tenor tuba is playing equivalent of a G sharp, an octave, and a major second below, just like bass clarinet reading. This overlaps into the next bar every time, and I feel that that is glue. In this case, the tenor tuba is taking on the role of the bass clarinet in a way, since they are very similar instruments not just in terms of their transposition, but in terms of their usability. As we've seen, Holst using the tenor trombone to solve little problems throughout this whole suite. But what's really cool here is contrasts of register. That's what this entire four bars is about. It's taking different positions of the same harmony and contrasting them against each other in really, really obvious ways. Now granted, some of these instruments are just going to be repeating right where they are for the most part because that is the safest place for them against the massive sound. But here we can see some pretty obvious jumps back and forth and the sound of a high G sharp is really going to sound different from the C sharp lower down. Okay, And we see that a little bit here in the flutes and the piccolos and we definitely can hear it in the clarinets and the bassoons going back and forth. Horns, just like the oboes, are basically staying in their safe place. Interestingly, the same basic C-sharp fifth in concert pitches, an octave lower, while some of the horns are just going back and forth on those pitches to provide motion. Notice that they're the same pitches, right? Isn't that funny? You've got G-sharp fifths here, and you've got your third and fourth horns going back and forth over those same notes, and then you've got the reverse in the fifth and sixth. I'm not really sure that that makes a whole lot of difference unless they were slurred, right? Then the effect of the slur going up and down, something that Tchaikovsky did, by the way, in the second movement of his Sixth Symphony. That would make a difference, but you would really need a different context. But probably what is the most severe contrast of register is what you're going to hear from the trumpets. Okay, And here's a really rare low G sharp. Now you might think, well, uh, that G sharp is 
unaccompanied. It's not doubled by a whole lot, is it? Uh, but no, you would be wrong if that were your assumption, because it's actually doubled quite nicely by the tenor tuba. Remember, we were talking before in some of these lectures about how Holst did not like to let low trumpet notes go by without doubling. So the fourth trumpet usually gets a lot of help. In this case, sorry to say fourth trumpeter, but you are being doubled by the tenor tuba. But here is really where you hear the contrasts of register, and that is going back and forth between this stacked set of fourths, right? It, it is a stacked set of G-sharp fourths, G-sharp, C-sharp, G-sharp, C-sharp, right? And then that is alternating with C-sharp fifths, C-sharp, G-sharp, C-sharp, G-sharp. And you really hear the contrast there. Going up a fifth or up a fourth for the trumpets, you start to get into not really different registers, but different colors very quickly, especially on that high G-sharp that can be a blistering note. And notice how Holst starts to simplify and amplify things towards the end. The tenor tuba starts to play quite high for it, right? So this is above the treble staff now. Remember your little transpositions, right? So this is G sharp, an octave higher, right? Alternating with the G flat here, which is the same thing as E, right? So this would be the same thing as G sharp here in the center of my pointer and E right there, which is pretty high for tenor tuba. I mean, not impossible, obviously, and some tenor tuba slash euphonium players can play extremely high, but orchestrally, I would say maybe going above B flat is not the wisest thing as some players can not really handle that. But as I was saying before, things being simplified and amplified, adding the piccolos on top, and finally alternating with the oboes of going back and forth, and the horns turning into octaves. It is really setting things up massively, and here's where the timpani roll just becoming extremely enormous, along with the cymbal roll has this overwhelming effect. It's wonderful when you add the rallentando here and the music is just getting bigger and slower and bigger and slower and bigger and slower. It's really setting up expectations for what is going to happen on the next screen. So we covered a lot before listening to the musical example. But look at all of those things, the way that the violins cross voices here alongside the oboes which are doubling and flutes which come in which are not crossing voices the sound of the clarinets in the back just repeating that g sharp octave and a sixth the really great accumulation of energy here as the crescendo and the mass increasing combines along with what we just talked about with the rallentando and the gradual, inexorable simplification and amplification of parts. And then, of course, all the fun stuff that leads up to it. The doubling of the oboes, horns, and upper strings playing in their lower positions on their G strings and C strings. And trumpets sort of dancing back and forth, imitating what happened before in the horns. And the lovely way that the tuba comes in here to give a little bit extra emphasis to the bass line as the timpani does its thing. Then of course listen for yourself for the contrast between the plucking sound of the harps against the contrabassoon and bassoon and then how the pizzicato comes in as the little jumping wind chorale happens above it. And see for yourself whether or not you feel that harp plucking was sufficient, really. I mean, it sort of is and it sort of isn't, and it maybe depends on where you're sitting in the hall and how the recording was done and everything else. But I feel with this tambourine crescendo and the timpani right here and this downward cascade, my personal feeling is it's just not quite enough. 
uh, and I would probably mark this forte, accents. <laughs> okay, so listen for all of those details that we covered, and I will see you after the big push. And that leads to this massive page here, right at figure seven. Okay, now you're probably looking at this page and saying, how on earth does Thomas look at this page and know what's going on? Well, the answer is that this is actually one of the simpler passages of Uranus. Yes, it's true. So we're going to break this down because Remember our three basic elements of orchestration, texture, balance, and function, right? So merely by looking at what the function is on this page, what we're going to see is that not only is this actually fairly simple in terms of structure, but it's actually repeated exactly the same twice. The span from here to here is exactly the same as the span from here to here. So that actually solves our problem considerably. So let's take a look at the architecture of this first phrase. And then that will just completely give us most of next page. Once again, let's start with the umpa. We've got our ones and fives here. And this is really, really easy for cellos to do, right? This is open C and fingered C above it on the G string. Uh, so going back and forth and then just letting go of the fingered C here and then playing the open G string right there. So it's just going back and forth. And of course, single notes on the double bass, just a total piece of cake. Now here we get into octave Cs and this shows you that at that time, Holst would have thought that a C extension double bass would have been available to him. One of those rare moments when the double bass really does go below the standard E. And this is possible. That could be done pretty easily. Same kind of thing. Open C below, fingered C on the A string. Not a big deal at all. And just like I said, past this midway point here, the phrase just repeats. Same exact thing goes back to where it was, right? Now I want you to look over the rest of this screen for yourself and look for those same notes, that same function. Just pick it out with your eye, and what do you see? I'm hoping that what you're seeing is timpani, just going C, G, C, G, C, G, right? And bass tuba going C, G, C, G, C, G. Bass trombone doubling what the timpani was doing, C, G, C, G then contrabassoon and third bassoon, C, G, C, G, right? So did you see those functions and identify them? Great. Now, let's go on to the next function while we're up here. Do you remember? Our little bar and a half rhythmic motive from last lecture. Okay, so it's returning now. Bass clarinet, bassoon, harmonized, right? And notice this, how it continues on, continues on exactly the same proportions, losing a bar, gaining a bar, losing a bar. And then here the pattern evens out as we get a bar of 9-4, so that we once again got our two beats of rest, and then it can start all over again. Same as here, two beats of rest, and then it starts. Now, once again, scan your eye down the page and look for all those other instruments that are doubling this particular idea. Did you see them? Yes, that's right. It's the violas, the xylophone, 
with this really great doubling, which I'll talk about in a minute, and tenor tuba, and timpani. Now, do you remember how we noted at the beginning that the first timpanist was getting four kettles, and the lowly second, <laughs> not really lowly, the second timpanist was only getting two kettles? And that was so that there could be this little idea here, bubble bubble played by just one timpanist, which, of course, it would be hard to divide this up between the two players without quite a bit of rehearsal time. So here, the barudem, bum 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 bum, is played out on just one kettle, and I feel that it's extremely effective. It just gives so much push to this. When we add that together with viola, which <laughs> it's going to be hard to hear at triple forte in all of these instruments, but there it is. It's got to do something, right? So viola, tenor tuba, bass clarinet, bass oboe, right? And bassoons. When we put all of those together, then we do have something that can compete with this enormously, hugely overbalanced, harmonized melody above. Okay. So let's go back to that xylophone. So this is the part that you're probably going to notice the most. It's going to stand out of the texture just very, very easily. And played really, really loudly on a xylophone. You know, wooden instrument, wooden sticks. It really sticks out. And this really does bring to mind the whole idea of sorcery, of conjuring, stage magic. I think a really nice balance between real magic and stage magic, right? There's always an element of trickery in this, almost like somebody with something up their sleeve, as opposed to an actual creator god. Do you know what I mean? Like somebody who's really doing some actual magic, right? So I feel that this really adds to that impression, despite the fact that we've got this enormous enormous texture going on throughout the entire orchestra. <laughs> you know, we still have just that element of chicanery, I feel, and that is somewhat expressed by the xylophone, the ambiguity of it. Now, before we move on to the scoring of the melodic elements, let's take one last look at percussion, because we're on that subject, and look at how We've got this massive whoosh here in the cymbals. Now, it won't be a crash because previous to this, there was a roll, right? So this is just the end of the roll. So this isn't two plates crashing together. This is that sort of whoosh sound as the percussionist lets go of the roll and just lets the dish vibrate with all of its built-up potential energy. And then, of course, a massive stroke by the bass drum and if we just look at how this is scored, you know, what is happening on that first beat? We've got the big octaves here in the lower strings, a low C in the bass tuba. Same thing happening with contrabassoon and third bassoon. And bass trombone. And that really is it, right? Plus the timpani strokes. So if you just hit that bass drum, it might wallop everybody on the head. You know what I mean? So that you can't really hear anything else. But you might as well put in those notes as well. No matter what you read in Adler or Piston about the bass drum being so loud that everybody else might as well not even play. Well, they might as well play. Because it's actually not entirely true. You'll still hear some small element of pitch. And especially very, very low coming in under the bass drum to a degree in some of these pitches, like, say, the double bass and the contrabassoon. So the cumulative effect here is that you might as well put it in rather than just leaving it out because of something you read in an orchestration manual, right? Okay, now let's talk about the harmonization of the melody. And I hope that you notice that we have actually gone through this screen very, very quickly. And why is that? Because, like I said before, this is really not that complicated of a page. It's a fairly simple scoring. Very, very direct, very beautiful, very savage. 
but fairly simple scoring. So let's just go straight to the violins and see what's happening here. And you'll notice that it is just a big unison all the way through. So that means that in a standard orchestra, you would have maybe 30, a bigger orchestra, maybe even quite a few more violins all together. They're all playing this one single note. And why is that? Well, it's because everybody else is so loud, right? We've got pretty much all the upper winds, plus clarinets. We've got all the horns. <laughs> We've got all the trumpets. We've got Atu trombones. So that is really going to cut through. But it's not enough just to say, oh, well, all these other instruments are playing. Let's see how they play, right? So just by looking at the first note here, noticing that it is a G, then we can extrapolate from there where everybody else is in terms of doubling that note and being a direct contributor to the melody or whether they are harmonizing. All right, so that is just a really fast trick. So let's move our way up the score here. Tenor trombones, A2, they are both playing Gs. Remember your tenor clef reading. All right, so that is a G. So this is going to be an octave below this G. Anybody else playing that same note? That same G right above middle C? Well, uh, just look up here. Look at the first two staves of horns, first and second, third and fourth. Those are both G's, right? Because remember your transposition. Right? So this is coming in right on the G line, a fifth below. Oh, and look at this, a two trumpets. So the third and fourth trumpet are doubling with the tenor trombone and the first two ranks of horns. This is kind of a military operation here. And who else is playing along on that lower G? Uh, English horn, look at that. And the third clarinet. All right, so that kind of establishes what's going on with that lower G. Now who's playing on exactly the same G as the violins? Well, we've got first trumpet, and that's kind of interesting, isn't it? That so much weight is being placed below, right? We've got four massive heavy brass playing triple forte below, plus the horns, four horns, so much weight there, but there's only one trumpet, right? There's only one first trumpet. And this harmonization here, let's just give a quick word to that so we can get that out of the way. So E flat coming in there under the G, and the same thing is happening here in the fifth and sixth horn, right? And that's the same E flat right there, an octave lower. And here's the same E flat here in the clarinets. So the clarinets are basically doubling what's going on in the trumpets. And that is something that you'll hear in Massive Tutis a lot. It's sort of a choice of what to do with the clarinets. So are the clarinets going to double the oboes? And I'm talking about Massive Tutti, Fortissimo, Triple Forte, where you really have the orchestra playing right out there on the edge. Sometimes Tchaikovsky, for instance, elects to have the clarinets and the oboes play harmonic thirds together. And sometimes he chooses to have the clarinets play along with the trumpets. But here Holst has elected to do both because there, in exactly the same configuration, are the oboes and English horn, which are playing the same exact notes as the clarinets and the same exact notes as the trumpets, right? Remember D sounding G? And of course, if you remember your B flat clarinet transposition, this is a G octave with an E flat in the middle. You'll have to excuse me if you hear meowing in the background and the occasional clunking. It is my 16 week old kitten who is crawling all over the place and making it very difficult for me to record in the morning. But as she grows up, she'll be better at this, I'm sure. So that is really telling you that this G does not actually have that much weight on it, does it? It's just first oboe, 
first clarinet, and first trumpet. So that's three instruments playing along with, I don't know, 30, 35 strings. It would be less in a smaller orchestra, of course. You might only end up having like maybe 24 uh, first and second violins all together. Or who knows, maybe 22 or even 20. I've seen small orchestras get away with adding a little bit of amplification to their string section just because it was so hard to find enough string players. And it actually sounded pretty good. But obviously nothing that you would want to do with a serious recording or a serious performance of something like this, but good enough for a community orchestra. Okay, and then an octave higher, we've got that same E flat third, G on top, right? And let's talk about that E flat, that little harmonization. It just basically goes on and on, kind of a little pedal inside the choral harmony, right? That E flat just continues on here. We've got a unison, and there's slightly different harmonization coming in with A in the oboe and so on, and in the clarinets. But I think it's still pretty neat, the way this whole thing works. And, of course, you're welcome to take this apart on your own a little bit. But suffice to say that now you see that this page is really simple. I mean, I look at this and I just see that it's a four-handed piano score that has been spread out across the entire orchestra at triple forte. And it is extremely effective. It's huge. I'm not putting it down. But it's direct. Do you know what I mean? It's not like a page of Stravinsky's introduction to the Rite of Spring, where you've got everybody doing different functions. This is everybody coming together, you know, working in ranks, right? We're going back to our very, very first lecture on Mars, where we noticed that there was not really a militaristic approach, but just very much a group approach to this with everybody working together as organized as an army sometimes, especially in these massive marches. And this also kind of knocks me out, it's something that my my father used to say, is that the bumble bum bum in the timpani is being doubled by tenor tuba at an octave higher. And tenor trombones as well. So they're basically playing this all together, this brass here, and then the timpani an octave lower than that. And it works really, really good. So you should listen for that when we do the playback. Now let's turn the page. And now that you've trained your eye, and perhaps even your inner ear's comprehension of what's going on here, then you can see that it really is just the same thing happening again. And it pretty much goes right up to here, and then we have got the melody fulfilling itself instead of stopping itself, fulfilling itself in this big chord here. And I'm not going to pick apart the harmony for you. All right, you can, you can just basically see what's going on here. But let's look at some of the functions here. This little riff here is being developed by being doubled by violins, Flutes and piccolos at the same pitch, an octave higher. Oboes and clarinets at the same pitch. And it's very forceful. As long as that xylophone is joining in and all the other players are really giving it everything, we don't need to worry about trumpets doubling it, which I think would sound kind of comical anyways. And really, uh, even though the trumpets are very easy to hear in this last part, they're barely being used at all. Right, just every other bar plus a pickup. Right, so they're kind of their half as much as you might even think. They get out of the way so that the upper winds and strings can do their thing, right? <laughs> and everybody else is just marching along, but notice the difference because we are headed to this extremely firm, enormous chord here. Holst has dispensed with the rests. And these are basically just big, long, tenuto, dotted half notes now, right? But pretty much the same suspects as before. Since the bassoons are giving up on our little rhythmic riff there, they're going to join in A3. 
So very, very firm sound now. And those poor violas are playing along and just adding a little bit of tone weight to these massive brass and wind chords and probably not making a huge amount of difference, but if it's a really big orchestra, maybe some. I really love the contrasting sound of it. Right? It's It contrasts registers and timbral qualities and textural qualities really beautifully. It's really worth studying. I mean, I could do a whole hour lesson on this, but we need to uh, do this lecture in less than five hours, okay? So let's move on. I love this final bum bum, along with full organ, he says. So just pull all the stops out and do a big old glissando, ripping across here. I think this isn't as evident in the recording that we're going to listen to in just a minute. But all the same, it's a very, very effective idea. It just really smears across the orchestra. Everybody else is just basically continuing on. Rolantando, of course. And this is a very exaggerated slowing down. But really, when you look at it, it's kind of a very standard C major chord scoring, right? You've got your E sixths here. You got this little G, C in the bass instruments, right, going across there. And here's our E sixth with a high C in there. This is kind of fun, this B right on top here. This turns it into a kind of C major seventh chord. But the overtones from this are going to be so shrill that it's just going to blend into the rest of the color, rather than standing out as a discrete harmonic element. This is almost more of a textural element than it is really a harmonic element. And then E-thirds from the oboe and a nice 6-4 chord here in the clarinets. Written as a D chord, of course, but sounding as a C chord. And so on. This is a C. And that's a G and so on. And right here we've got a nice C major octave chord from the trumpets. This is going to be very, very big. High C right there at quadruple F is going to be probably the loudest sound that you hear. This one single note there is going to just scream over the rest of the orchestra. That's if the tenor trombones and bass trombone don't take this quadruple F literally and play with everything they've got, in which case they can swamp the orchestra just as much as a bass drum strike. And then here, gong, meaning tam-tam, is hitting this right smack on the nose. So that is a lot to absorb, even just looking at this chord. And the payoff on the next page is something hugely surprising and fun, if you are not that familiar with Uranus, and you'll be expecting it if you are familiar with it. But think about all of those things, but especially the breakdown of functions here and seeing that it really is not that difficult. In fact, 2T scoring can be some of the simplest kinds of scoring that there are, especially if you want a very direct approach, right? So we're going to listen to this page now in the next one, and please do not be intimidated. And also remember all of the architecture that we just explored and notice how everything works together in a beautifully balanced way and I will see you in a couple of screens. So how can you follow that massive tutti in the most surprising, most devastating way? By not having a tutti and having something extremely mysterious. And this is an extremely simple way 
to build that kind of mood. We have a mysterious chord here, basically C minor with A and F in the bass. And notice how it's gone down to two desks, <laughs> divisi. Right, so you only have two players on each note. Very, very, very soft texture there. Here we've got a little F third here. And this F note is right below this A right here. So it's forming a little F third underneath C minor. Now let's think about exactly what is going to happen to the listener's ear in the audience. Your ears are going to be slightly compressed because of the enormous sound of that tutti. You know, everything that is stuck in there, the enormous gong crash, and the instrument screaming at you, and the full organ doing its big smear, kind of glissando, everything else. So your ears are going to be slightly compressed there, and then suddenly let go. So this harmony here is going to seem to emerge from the chaos of what was happening before. I know it was very, very carefully controlled. It wasn't really chaos, but the chaos of the sound waves in the concert hall and the chaos of your ears feeling all of this pressure on them. And suddenly they're released. And even if it's really, really obvious where this chord comes in, it's still going to feel like it emerges from the echoing, from the opening up of your ears. And I feel that this works best when the conductor does not wait for the reverberation in the concert hall to settle. And I've actually seen it performed that way a couple of times, which I feel is just a complete mistake. This should come in right away so that the ear does not actually hear it at first. If you're listening to this piece with, say, maybe uh, some crummy computer speakers or whatever, and you get to that last bar, then you may not even know that the piece hasn't ended, right? For some listeners in the concert hall, something similar will be happening. If they did not see the conductor's arms move up on the podium, they might not really perceive immediately that the piece has come to a stop. I mean, especially with two desks divisi on each part, right? That's, that is a small amount of instruments compared to what was just happening. And into that beautiful release, we are putting in second harp, playing the stacked E fifths. And then when that stops, we've got our little motif. Bum, 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 bum. Notice we've also gone to 4-4 four, four time. I should have pointed that out. Then this beautiful reaching gesture, taking us back to that same chord again, only harmonized a little differently. Notice we've got the same, essentially, C minor chord. We had D sharp here, but it's the same note as this E flat, for all intents and purposes. And then E flat here, along with the D sharp there, being the same note as well. And we've got the F third here, emphasized a little bit more in the cellos this time. And here, it's gone back to tutti, non divisi, right? So, double stop octaves going to this E flat sixth. This is all very easy stuff to do, non divisi, especially at lento. The players can really find their fingers easily. And that is why you don't see the cellos here with a sign saying two desks divisi. It's just because everybody is all 2T, but still controlled, right? And I think that that's wise, because you're going to get more projection now. So in case anybody in the audience is kind of unsure about what's going on, this is going to reassure them. Hey, the piece is continuing on. 
right, in a very mysterious way, Ernest the Magician, for all of his bragging, for all of his stagecraft, we thought that he was a complete charlatan, and now he's disappeared and taken the universe with him, (laughs) and we're just floating in space. Well, I guess he wasn't a phony after all, right? (laughs) That's kind of the imagery I get from this, is a very perplexed audience, kind of floating around in limbo, kind of wondering what happened. And still, one desk playing that F in the double basses. Kind of not really making that much difference, but they might as well continue their presence there. Same thing happens to a degree. We've left off one of these chords and shortened the distance between here and there. Now it's just a bar and a beat instead of two bars and a beat. So let's listen to that. I know that wasn't a whole lot compared to those massive pages and those long stretches of lecture that I've been giving you, but maybe that's a relief, eh? So let's just listen to this softer passage, and I'll see you on the next screen. And listen for all of those things, the very effective harp harmonics and the kind of tragic stacked E-fifths coming in here against this beautifully weird harmony there of the F-thirds under the C minor chord. Okay, and just how the quality changes when we go to tutti, but still soft strings. So, just when you thought that you were going to be floating in limbo forever, Ernest returns, and I think he wants to get paid, pretty much, right? And we start to pile on all of the stuff, big, huge chords, and I guess our wallets just didn't have that much money in it because he's going to leave us in limbo again right at the end. (laughs) Wasn't too happy about that, so... Who knows? Notice the mixed meters here. We're still cruising along in 4-4 time for half of the orchestra, but the other half is going to be playing 6-4 against the 4-4. So they're going to be interpreting 1-2-3-4 as 1-2-3-4-5-6, right? And this stuff is very familiar to you, as I'm sure you will just see right away, having gone through the past couple of lectures Bum, 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 bum. Just going over that same bum, 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 bum pitches, right? Then harmonized in bassoons and bass clarinets, bass oboe, the reedy bunch. Coming in right off the tail of that, the tuba duo in octaves. Bum, 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 bum. And they're still in 4 4 time, right? So they're reading this as straight half notes. And as they play this reminder of the riff once again, The timpani comes in and plays the same pitches of that riff, and this time just basically playing them along to 6-4 time, and then 4 against 3, and then every single eighth note, rolling, joining in here with all the strings, this time in octaves, this is all the upper strings on the same pitch and all the lower strings on the same pitch. And that's being doubled by horns from above plus third and fourth trumpet. And then tenor trombone and tenor tuba are playing along. And that's enough weight right there. He doesn't need to throw in the bass trombone and the bassoons and everybody else to really sit on that. That's going to be loud enough. Notice coming from that really, really soft place and getting a gradual crescendo in here and then hearing this loud but not too loud little phrase here 
and then having the timpani sort of blunder around here. By the time we get here, even though we heard a massive tutti a couple of pages before, this is still going to sound loud to us because we had a little bit of a breather, and we're coming back to the idea of loudness now. You'll still find it hard to hear the strings all that well against this kind of weight. It's just so fat, and especially with the timpani rolling on this F. But I love the solidity of this boom. We've got B in the first timpani and A below, a nice rock bottom A from the second timpanist. And of course, along with that, E pedal in organ, double bass on that low E, bass clarinet joining in with bassoon and contrabassoon, and bass trombone and bass tuba in octaves. So you put all those low winds, low brass, low timpani, low organ pedal, and low double bass together, and you just have the most devastating sound. Just really fat, low, massive, single note. And as that's holding, we have this very infuriated chord. You could see this as a devastated chord. You could see this as infuriated. I like to think that Ernest is infuriated because, I mean, come on, he just put on the most great show for these ungrateful humans, and they just don't have the decency to compensate him. I don't know what he wants. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's worship. Maybe it's a bunch of other things. But yeah, he's just not going to let us get away with this, I think. Pretty satisfying tutti scoring when you think about it. Just very briefly looking at this. Upper strings and then violas below cellos in a really nice voice crossing. Then looking over here horns and trombones below these scorching trumpets and then <laughs> the reeds all getting together for this underneath the flute and piccolo all right so it just really has this cutting sound don't forget the tenor tuba right in there throwing in an e flat it's the same e flat as this horn right here the concert e flat and of course the same note as this cello right here, playing a D-sharp and harmonically. So we pretty much have the same elements coming in again, this time adding cellos, but not quite as loud for the timpani and lower brass. Right there playing octaves, meno F. Second timpanist, meno F, so not as loud. But notice that Hulse doesn't bother telling that to the lower winds here. It's still triple F accented in the lower winds and the lower strings. Then everybody tails off here dynamically as we get the reaction chord, which is not as screamy this time. You notice we've left out some of the screamy elements. It's really just horns, reeds, and the upper strings playing in a lower position, basically everything kind of an octave down and reharmonized. And then mezzo forte, lower strings, little mezzo forte stroke on second timpani, and bassoons and flute and bass flute. Here's our bass flute coming in just for one note here. <laughs> I told you at the beginning of the first lecture we were going to see some bass flute. Well, there it is. You happy now? Yeah, really, so that is just a G down there. And notice that it's it's just the simplest, simplest harmony. In this case, bass flute, really alto flute, right, everybody? So in this case, the alto flute is going to sort of be heard there, uh, especially as things start to die down. It will be coming in a little bit clearer. And then harps come in, just little teeny strokes of an E fifth, doubling what's going on here in the top note of the left hand and the right hand for the second harp. And that's really effective, by the way. A controlled timpani stroke against harp when there is no kind of competition for the harpist, or hardly any. 
and then very, very soft trombones and horns. And let me tell you, if you want a beautifully spooky or beautifully distant sound uh, in terms of a harmonic pad, you can easily write something like that for horns and trombones and just have them come in being incredibly soft in the background. It does not have to always be about being loud for the trombones and the horns. I know there are a zillion jokes about trombones being loud, but they can really play spookily soft. And then finally, that low harmony settles in on the strings, triple P. And as they're playing, we get our one last little riff, bum, bum, bum. And that is allowed to end with a blunk. Blunk. So I guess our poor imaginary audience here for the magician is just going to have to float around in limbo. But as far as right here on the real world, let's listen to this whole screen one more time, and then I will see you for the last lectures of this series of orchestration analysis, Neptune the Mystic. And that has got some of the most wonderful, beautiful, evocative textures in it. I can't wait to show them to you, but I will have to because life is sort of rushing in as I finish some other big projects. So I have to take care of that. But Patreon followers, that is going to come possibly a week or so into the month of December. Following on YouTube, this is going to be coming up next month for you in February. So listen for all of the things that we talked about. The low reads coming in there, the tuba octaves, the timpani going crazy, the joining in on that bum, 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 and then big reaction chord, and then the way that it slowly subtracts elements and calms down and then just gives the chords to the different sections and the way that the harps come in here and there. And you might have to listen to some parts a little bit more closely than others just because of the way that this particular music clip is recorded. It's not going to be making compensations for the fact that you have turned things down because it got so loud here. Right? It's going to be very hard to hear. So you may need to adjust your volume as you go to hear all of the little subtleties in the softer parts. Okay? So enjoy that, and I will see you soon for Neptune. <laughs>